Hey guys, uh, welcome to the digestive system and general nutrition. All right, let's get rolling. So, uh, main steps in the digestive process. The question becomes, why do we eat? The goal will be to take this hamburger, all right, which is big and uh, full of what we call macromolecules. These are big molecules that you can't get in. <clears throat> a, a very complex item, many different food sources found here, and we want to get that to our individual cells. All right, you gotta get that burger to your cells. How do you do that? Now, you can't just rub that burger against you. The goal is fourfold. We have ingestion to bring that into the body, digestion, first mechanical, then chemical, wherever I have chemical on here, but chemical all the same, uh, digestion, oh, <laughs> The mechanical means to break it up into smaller pieces. So you take that burger and you break it up into smaller pieces. We do this by chewing. We do this by the grinding motions of the stomach. And then we have to break it down chemically. So we take its macromolecules and we break those down into more simplistic molecules uh, using um, uh, enzymes specifically and some other chemical means like the acidity of the stomach. Uh, once we have broken that food down through hydrolysis reactions, complex to simple, uh, then we will absorb the nutrients from whatever we can get, all right? Uh, we have a, a portion of the small intestine that is specifically set up to allow us to absorb nutrients from that mechanically and then chemically digested food. And once we have absorbed everything we can absorb from it, we eliminate the rest as waste products, as fecal materials, all right? So ingestion, bring it in, digestion, two parts. Absorption, absorb what you can in the small intestine, then elimination uh, via uh, production of feces. Now, a couple of more comments before I go through this. One, movement and peristalsis. So your intestinal tract, your stomach, your esophagus, all of it, all of it, it is uh, capable of peristaltic motion. In other words, this is that set of rhythmic contractions which pushes materials from one place to the next. Uh, that would be movement. And what that really is getting at is that your whole digestive tract is just packed with muscle. Smooth muscle, but muscle all the same. Okay, your whole GI tract, gastrointestinal, is uh, packed with musculature. So it's quite muscular. And in fact, when we look at this, we can see it. So uh, this is set up exactly the way you would expect most of the muscular, or I'm sorry, most of the systems in your body to be built. What we have is an inner lining called a mucosa. Okay, the mucosa is the inner lining, uh, followed by a submucosa, which is going to be uh, made of connective tissue. So the mucosa is probably epithelia, and uh, that's going to be a, a means of transport one place to another. Then there's going to be a submucosa made out of connective tissue, which provides blood flow for the mucosa. Outside of that, there is a muscularis externi, or a muscularis. There would be two layers to this in most cases, a layer of circular muscle and a layer of longitudinal muscle. Basically, this allows for this pumping action of peristalsis to uh, undergo what it does. And uh, last but not least, an outside serosa. And the serosa is going to be uh, basically a covering for the outer surface of that muscular uh, musculature, I should say. Yes, perfect. Now, very important, circular layer and longitudinal layer make up the vast majority of the intestinal tract, the vast majority of the GI tract as a whole. All right, <clears throat> here's an overview of all the organs and organ system parts and pieces of the digestive system. <clears throat> what I want to point out is the pathway that food follows on its way through this system. You'll notice that in all the chapters we've done, we've been following paths. This is no different. What we do is we go from the mouth into the pharynx, kind of the back of your throat, down your esophagus. Again, the esophagus lays against the trachea. Your trachea is in the front. You can feel the tracheal bits, these hard pieces of cartilage. The esophagus is in the back, and it's, it's muscular. It has no cartilaginous reinforcements. All right, so the esophagus is behind the trachea in reality. So you're looking at somebody from behind here. So um, again, like I can touch my Adam's apple. Think of this as part of the tracheal passages. Behind that would be my esophagus. And then behind that is my spinal cord. All right, anyway, mouth, pharynx, esophagus, down to the stomach, which is a storage vessel, the small intestine, which is where absorption takes place, the large intestine, seen here, uh, which basically is a dehydration center. It pulls water out of what will become feces. 
the rectum, which is a storage area, and the anal opening itself, which is how we eliminate waste. That, that is the pathway that food follows on its way through uh, this system. I'm happy with that. Let's go here. <clears throat> so let's start at the top and work our way down. The mouth. The mouth contains teeth that help us mechanically break down food. So the initial mechanical breakdown of food is done in the mouth by the teeth. Uh, the mouth also contains the tongue. The tongue kind of puts things where it needs to be. You can move things around inside the mouth. And further, contains taste buds on the tongue, uh, which help us to identify good things versus bad things in terms of the foods that we are eating. I'm sure that you have tried to eat something before and just couldn't swallow it down. There's something wrong with it. Uh, that is because the taste buds tell us if there's anything potentially dangerous in that food substance. Now, what the tongue does is it form, it takes whatever you bite off and it forms a kind of a small egg shape. Okay, they're called boluses, a bolus. Uh, you will form a small ovoid mass called a bolus of whatever food it is that you're trying to consume. That will then be coated in mucosal saliva and you will swallow that down the esophagus. Uh, first into the pharynx and then into the esophagus. Now in the mouth there are three salivary glands uh, that are producing a variety of chemicals, not just saliva, but a variety of chemicals. They also produce salivary amylase, which breaks down uh, starches like carbohydrates, and lingual lipase, which breaks down lipids. So the initial digestion of foodstuffs begins in the mouth, all right? Uh, the initial chemical digestion, not just mechanical digestion, but we have the capacity for some degree of chemical digestion starting very early. Okay, that's important. Now, you also have tonsils in the back of the throat. These also help to uh, note any potential pathogens that are coming into the body. Recall that uh, tonsils are part of the lymphatic system, and the lymphatic system is hand-in-hand -hand with your immune system. And also worthy of mention is that lysozyme is released here, lysozyme being a very powerful antibacterial agent, which kind of keeps uh, you from getting as many um, oral infections, let's say. <clears throat> All right, teeth. Uh, you have, uh, you know, give or take, 32 teeth in adults, 20 deciduous teeth in, uh, in youth, you might say. Uh, the teeth have two parts, a crown and a root. Um, teeth are made of a, the top surface at least, is made of a covering called enamel. And tooth enamel is the hardest substance made by the body. Now, there's a lot to talk about here. A lot to talk about. There are well, hang on, let me first talk about dental caries, and then we'll talk about the rest of this. So a cavity, or what we'd call in science a dental cary, is where there's a little indentation in the tooth, and you eat something like, let's say, chocolate to make this easy, and that chocolate gets deposited in that little bitty spot on top of that tooth. Well, what will happen then is if you, let's say, you lay down and go to sleep, a bunch of bacteria that live normally in your mouth, that normally that you, you have natural flora that don't hurt you, that are non-pathogenic, they're just hanging out and they're doing their thing. Um, they will get in there and they'll start breaking down whatever food stuff it is. And as they do so, part of their metabolism, the fermentative metabolism, is they release acid. They release acids. And as they release these acids, uh, they will eat away part of the tooth. So acidity and teeth does not go well together. Uh, so you get a little indentation, food gets in there, the bacteria get in there and they eat it and they release acid. That makes the hole get a little deeper and then more food gets in there and then the bacteria eat it and they release acids, the hole gets a little deeper and eventually that will get deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper until it gets into the dentin or potentially into the, the, the pulp here and it will begin to hurt. Okay, that is a cavity. And uh, they, are, they are not fun. It's a side effect of bacterial activity. Now, the reason that this is the problem is, and the reason that you can't fix a cracked tooth in most cases, is that uh, teeth do not contain, even though they are very bone-like, teeth are not bone. Okay, they are a whole different animal. Dentin and enamel, they are nothing like bone in reality. They, um, lack osteoblasts, I suppose is the main point to make here. They lack osteoblasts. And by lacking osteoblasts, that means that they cannot heal themselves. You can't heal a cavity. You can't heal a crack. It's not going to come back magically. You have to go get this taken care of, or else it's going to get worse and worse and worse, and you're going to end up with major problems. <clears throat> All right, how do we swallow food? Well, there's basically two phases, an involuntary phase and a voluntary phase. The voluntary phase is when we bite off 
and uh, we chew up and we make our bolus. Okay, we make our little ovoid mass of bolus. And then the involuntary phase is when we kind of use the tongue to push that back to the uh, pharynx, and that triggers a swallowing response. This involuntary phase where the uh, uh, tracheal passages move up and the epiglottis, okay, the epiglottis closes over the esophagus, and then peristaltic motion acts to push that bolus down the esophagus and into the stomach. In fact, you can see, whoop, going right on down. All right, watch it again. Here comes a bolus. Oh, it looks like a little mouse. <laughs> traveling down the length. So uh, that, that's what happens in our system as well. We make a bolus, and then through peristaltic action, we push that bolus down into our stomach. And the stomach. So the stomach is a, a storage body, no small part, and a metering system, and also a site of digestion. So the stomach can store about a liter of materials. Uh, the fluidy goo, if you will, that is in the stomach after you eat, it's no longer called food or a bolus at that stage, it's called chyme. I would know my terms. What's a bolus? What's chyme? All right. Chyme is the fluidy mass of uh, food and other digestive materials found inside of the stomach. Now the stomach is unique here because the stomach actually has three layers of muscle. Not only does it have a circular layer and a longitudinal layer, uh, but it also has a uh, oblique layer that assists in the stomach doing all kinds of crazy grindy activities. Uh, that is necessary. That is necessary for this structure to be able to process food the appropriate way. Uh, the stomach has deep wrinkles called rugae, not, not unlike the bladder. Why would the rugae be here as well? Because the stomach has to distend, it has to expand, and contract, and expand, and contract, and expand, and contract, and expand, and contract. These wrinkles help that internal lining to not be damaged by this activity. Uh, there are gastric glands inside the stomach that produce a fluid called gastric juice, and the gastric juice you need to know about. All right, gastric juice contains pepsin, which helps you break down proteins, and it's incredibly acidic, which actually activates that pepsin. Pepsin has to have a pretty acidic environment in order to function. You probably know that your stomach has acid, stomach acid, but you may not realize just how acidic it is. It is very acidic, in fact, all right, a pH of around 2. Uh, which is to the point that you put your hand in there for any period of time and you're going to come back with problems. Um, yeah, the, the acidity also helps break down food. That is a fact. And let's see, what else do we want to say here? Stomach empties chyme into the small intestine after a few hours. And the chyme is a partially digested food soup. Okay, there are a few other little things that we need to talk about. First things first. Uh, the stomach just doesn't dump materials into the small intestine. The stomach slowly meters out little bits of chyme at a time, just a little bit. Little bits at a time are metered out into the small intestine so that it can have maximal surface area against the small intestine. You don't just want to dump materials into the small intestine from the stomach because you're not going to have the ability to absorb all the nutrients that are provided there. So what we do is we, we put little bits at a time out into the small intestine so that the small intestine can have time to work on that stuff. And next is Heliobacter pylori. Heliobacter pylori, anything pylorus is stomach. Heliobacter pylori is the um, is a bacterium that is sometimes found in, in the stomach. Uh, for many, many years it was credited as the cause of stomach ulcers. Today we don't believe that's necessarily the case. There are uh, plenty of people with stomach ulcers that don't have Heliobacter pylori, and there's plenty of people with Heliobacter pylori that don't have stomach ulcers. Um, so this is a rare bacterium that can live in the stomach. For a long time it was thought of as being a causative factor for stomach ulcers, but now we are not so sure. Okay, perfect. <clears throat> Alright, the pancreas. Oh, so what we have here are the major uh, accessory organs that contribute to the small intestine and its absorptive and digestive capacities. These are the pancreas, the liver, and the gallbladder. And the liver and the gallbladder kind of go hand in hand for digestion. Can you give me some water? Yes, ma'am. Hang on. All right. <laughs> Where were we? That's, that's my girl. All right. <clears throat> pancreas, liver, and gallbladder. So the, the pancreas, uh, you know as making insulin and glucagon, but the pancreas not only has endocrine function, which is what that is, but the pancreas also has exocrine function. And the exocrine function of the pancreas is to make the enzymes amylase, trypsin, and lipase, as well as releasing a uh, chemical called bicarbonate, or bicarb for short. Um, so amylase is an enzyme that breaks down carbohydrates. 
Uh, trypsin is an enzyme that breaks down proteins. Lipase is an enzyme that breaks down lipids. And bicarb is a neutralizing agent for acids. So bicarb is a, um, a chemical that will take the acidic chyme of the stomach and very quickly neutralize that uh, to a normalized pH. So the chyme coming out of the stomach is like a pH of 2, and that would completely eat up the lining of the small intestine. The small intestine is not built to handle that level of acidity. So what you do is, the moment you dump food into the small intestine, the pancreas dumps bicarbonate into that chyme and puts the pH up to about a 7, okay, which would be about neutral. So we are neutralizing the pH using bicarb from the pancreas. Now the liver and the gallbladder. So what will really happen here, now the liver does a lot of things for you. You know, it filters your blood, it takes out toxins, uh, it pulls stuff out of the bloodstream all the time. But importantly for our conversation here is that the liver makes bile. Okay, bile is a breakdown product, or partially a breakdown product, of uh, red blood cells and it will then be stored in the gallbladder. The gallbladder is this crazy green color, okay? So the liver makes bile, bile is stored in the gallbladder, and when necessary, the gallbladder will send that bile down into the small intestine, okay? And what it will do there is it will lead to the emulsification of fats. Now, what the heck does that mean? Uh, the idea is that it's hard for you to get fats across your cell membranes. Okay, it's hard for you to get fats from one side of the cell membrane to the other side of the cell membrane. And um, to make this easier, we use a, a chemical emulsifier in bile to assist with this process. So what the heck's an emulsifier? An emulsifier is the same thing as like soap, for example. If you got oil on your hands, you can't just wash it off in water. You got to put a little soap on there and rub it around. And the, the um, soap molecules will bind to the oil molecules and dissolve them into the water. Well, that's what bile does for your intestinal tract. It dissolves um, that fat into uh, the fluid of chyme so that you can absorb it using your lacteals, for instance, in your intestines. Yeah, yeah, that'll work. Now, worthy of mention here, the liver is a big, substantial uh, organ. Like, if I had a liver and I threw it to you and it hit you, it, it would hurt. Like, it's a big, hard, it's, it feels like the bottom of your foot. It's solid, okay? Uh, whereas the pancreas is like a sack of cottage cheese. Like, this is the pancreas inside of a turn in the small intestine. So this is the small intestine, a turn of the small intestine, and that's the pancreas inside of there. Um, it is non-substantial. It's like a goo, uh, basically. It really does remind me of cottage cheese, uh, just kind of stuffed into some cheesecloth. That's <laughs> gross. All right, this is this is reality here. All right, uh, the small intestine. So chyme enters the small intestine uh, for a number of things to happen. Let's talk about why it's small. The small intestine is small in diameter. It's actually massive. This is a huge organ. Okay, the small intestine is huge. Uh, it's up to about 18 feet in length in a normal adult. It's small in diameter. It's only about two and a half centimeters in diameter. So it's small in diameter but super long. And that's important because again what we want is surface area folks. We want surface area. So uh, enzymes secreted by the pancreas assist us in, in breaking down these um, um, nutrients, carbs, proteins, and fats, bile is there to emulsify those fats so that we can better absorb them using the small intestine. Now, the small intestine is not only small in diameter, which increases surface area, but it also has villus. Uh, villi are little finger-like projections that just, that just line, these finger-like projections just line the intestine. If you look here, you can see them. All these villi, they just line the small intestine and uh, vastly increase its surface area. And in fact, if you look at the villi themselves, and you take a little piece out of this and look at it, it will have microvilli. You can look at this image and see this. So here's a villus, and then there are microvilli that are little projections that stick off of this. This is oftentimes called a brush border or a brushy border. Um, the idea is that, and this is a take-home message, the um, intestines have incredibly high surface area. The small intestine in particular has incredibly high surface area. The, the projection is that the 18 feet of small intestine in an average adult will have the surface area of about a, like a tennis court, a full-size tennis court. So it's huge. Okay, so long story short, <clears throat> the intestine is where digestion is completed and nutrients are absorbed, period. 
So you finish digesting the food, you absorb all the nutrients you can possibly absorb from the food, all that is done in the 18 feet of the small intestine. Remember, 18 feet, that is a long way for you to get all the nutrients into the bloodstream like uh, carbohydrates and proteins and the fats, any lipids are going to come in via the lacteals that are also inside of here that are part of that lymphatic system, the lacteals that we talked about the last time through. Um, so yeah, yeah. The idea is the small intestine is where you finish digestion and you finish absorption. So what the heck is the large intestine for? Um, before I go there, let me just show you. This is kind of neat. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail here. Um, if, we had, if this was class and we had more time, I would. But uh, what we have, this is a real intestinal tract. This is a real human intestinal tract. You can see the esophagus. Here's the liver and the stomach and the pancreas is kind of in pieces back there. But small intestine, very large. And then this large intestine, just bigger in diameter but pretty short by comparison. This is my wife uh, for comparative purposes. So all that would be in there. Uh, the intestine, the small intestine is broken down into parts. You can see those listed here. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on this. What I want to point out is all these villi, these finger-like projections that are inside of here. And interestingly, the very last part of the small intestine has these uh, what are called Peyer's patches. And Peyer's patches are um, immune tissue, basically. They're, they're lymphatic, but they're, they're immune tissue uh, that helps you see if there's any potential pathogens growing in your small intestine. So we want to keep those out. So these are an early warning system for pathogens, uh, things that can hurt us in the intestinal tract. Yeah, that's all I want to say about that. Now the large intestine. The large intestine is large because it's large in diameter. The small intestine is about two and a half centimeters in diameter. Large intestine is uh, six and a half centimeters in diameter. Uh, the large intestine has parts. These are called the cecum, the ascending, transverse, and descending, and sigmoid colon, followed by the rectum, which is like a storage area, and the, the anal canal where we let stuff out. All right. Now, the concept of the large intestine is that it is a dehydration center. What the large intestine does is it pulls out the water. The fluid that enters into the large intestine is, is watery, man. It is straight up water. Uh, with, with all sorts of unabsorbable garbage in it. Stuff that your body doesn't need. Wastes. Things you don't want. Bacterial growth is rampant here. And uh, you got to get rid of that stuff. But you can't get rid of it with the water because you'll die of dehydration. So what do you do? The large intestine pulls out the water. And as a side effect to pulling out the water, it can pull in certain other uh, potential nutrients, but that's neither here nor there. The role of the large intestine is to pull out water. Yes, perfect. Now let me point out this too. Uh, the uh, external and internal anal sphincters. Uh, when the internal anal sphincter opens and allows feces to move out towards the external anal sphincter, uh, that's when you get a sensation like you need to go to the bathroom. The internal, I'm sorry, the external anal sphincter is made out of skeletal muscle and you have conscious control over that uh, to decide when you're going to go or not. In other words, this is very similar to how the bladder works. Very similar. Absorbing water. All right, speaking of feces, let's talk about it. So uh, fecal materials are mostly water, about three quarters water. There's a lot of bacteria that are growing in there, a lot of dietary fiber that you can't digest, any other indigestible materials for that matter. Uh, the smell of feces is because the bacteria inside of it are, are growing and, and eating whatever's there and releasing gases. So the gas that we make as uh, mammals, that is due to bacteria in our intestinal tract. The color of feces is due to a number of things. Bilirubin, which is broken down red blood cells basically, uh, gives rise to a yellowish orangey pigment. Uh, oxidized iron from red blood cells gives uh, feces a brown color. And then a green stool uh, would be a side effect of either eating a lot of chlorophyll or having feces move through very quickly and not be fully absorbed. So you're not absorbing all the fats from it as you could. Um, and just for fun, these are real poops here. These are what do we call um, coprolites. These are dinosaur feces, okay? Which is kind of neat from my perspective. And people will take these and, and cut them and polish them and make all kinds of neat stuff out of them. It's rock at this point, but it's dinosaur poop. This is actually a knife handle um, made out of a coprolite, which is kind of wild to me. How much fun would you have having a full set of cutlery in your house with coprolite handles 
so that if somebody comes over and they're eating at your place, you can say, hey, you know what that handle's made out of? Yes. I would love that sort of thing, but you can see here, it's pretty neat. Pretty neat stuff. All right. Uh, digestive disorders, of which there are several. So hepatitis, cirrhosis, and heartburn. Uh, hepatitis is any inflammation of the liver. There are actually a variety, a variety of different forms of hepatitis. Things like A, B, and C, for example. Some are more easily treated than others, but all can be treated today. Uh, so you, there were times this was a death sentence no longer. Um, yeah, no longer. Then there is cirrhosis of the liver. Cirrhosis is any situation where the liver becomes very fatty and the fat turns into scar tissue over time. This is seen in alcoholics uh, specifically. So alcohol is actually an incredibly high energy molecule. And when you drink a lot of alcohol, all that energy has to go somewhere and it's turned into fat that is then stored in the liver. Uh, and the liver gets fatty because you drink too much and that turns into scar tissue and then the liver basically stops working. Okay, that is cirrhosis. And then there's heartburn. So heartburn is caused by the uh, esophageal sphincter, which is here that would normally close off the stomach. It begins to malfunction, and some of the acidity of the stomach makes its way up into the esophagus, which has no shielding for acidity, and the acid of the stomach begins to eat away the lining of the esophagus. Uh, this is um, oftentimes seen specifically in, in pregnancy or when you eat a big meal. So anything that puts a lot of pressure in the abdomen is going to push up against the stomach and can potentially force a little bit of that uh, chyme in there back up into the esophagus and cause problems. Uh, in terms of the lower digestive tract diseases, there are a number of these, like diarrhea. Well, it makes me sad. I can't remember what rhea means at this point. But anyway, diarrhea, uh, this is where the uh, typically the lining of the large intestine gets irritated and it just throws everything out as quickly as possible. Increased peristalsis, uh, you don't absorb water, so you just fire out whatever's in the large intestine and get rid of it. Uh, that's a real problem because it can lead to dehydration if you don't have enough fluids. Constipation is literally the opposite of this. This is when feces refuse to move out. Uh, they be, get very dry and very hard, basically turn into little rocks. And the concept is that, let me see if I can find a better picture. This is stored in the rectum. So the rectum is quite large actually. Um, so you can't squish this stuff down for it to exit the anal canal uh, readily. So on its way out, if you've been constipated and it's very dry, uh, this can cause all sorts of problems. Tearing and damage. Hemorrhoids can form as a result of inflaming the blood vessels around the anal opening. Uh, no fun. No fun. Uh, Diverticulosis, also no fun. Uh, what will happen here is there will be weaknesses and set weaknesses in typically the descending colon, the sigmoid colon. And uh, as feces are moving through and the muscular action therein, you can actually get basically little, um, what do you call it, um, hernias, uh, bits of mucosa that form these blind-ended sacs on the outside of the large intestine. And I'm told this is very painful. Uh, they will get inflamed and infected and they kind of pop internally and it's, it's awful. Uh, and then last but not least, pops and cancer. So uh, once you get in your mid to late 30s, you'll have to start getting, uh, what do you call it, colonoscopies. So they'll go in with a camera and they'll inflate the intestinal tract and they'll look for any weird growths in there. And it's a very simple procedure. Uh, they'll just go in and use a hot wire and snip that sucker right on off of there and call it a day. Uh, this is very straightforward and done all the time. All the time. And uh, on to nutrients. All right, in terms of nutrients, so these are going to be uh, things that we get through our diet that we need to survive. They help us grow and develop and uh, maintain our systems. These nutrients will include carbs, proteins, lipids, minerals, and vitamins. Now, carbohydrates um, are a wonderful energy source, man. They're fantastic, especially in their natural format. So complex carbohydrates like whole grain products, nuts and fruits and beans and what have you, uh, these are great for you, man. They're, they're totally healthy. They move through your system slow. They don't spike your glucose levels. Uh, totally fine. Knock yourself out. Our problems come in with refined grains. Refined grains, think about like um, my, my Dr. Pepper here, all right? So uh, refined grains like white bread, Dr. Pepper, um, do I have more examples here? I mean, you name it. Uh, the cookies I just ate a, a little while back. Um, all of those, by the time they hit your stomach, you might as well have just been eating spoonfuls of sugar, okay? 
all of the stuff, all the fiber and what have you that would have been inside of there, all the vitamins, they are removed through the refining process. So this is basically the same as this. It's the same stuff, man. Again, you drink it, Dr. Pepper, might as well be drinking spoonfuls of sugar. You eat a piece of white bread, might as well be eating spoonfuls of sugar. Eat, eat a honey bun, spoonfuls of sugar, man. It's all the same thing. Uh, and these are very dangerous. Um, these refined grains will lead to uh, obesity, heart disease, liver disease, cancers, uh, insulin resistance, you know, type 2 diabetes. I mean, you name it, man. This is, this is rough stuff. Because uh, refined grains, like, spike your insulin levels. That's the problem with them. Um, complex carbs, your, your rise in blood sugar will go up slow, and then it'll tail slow over time. Uh, whereas if you're consuming the same amount of sugar as refined grain, uh, when it hits your stomach, it spikes like this, and then it slowly tails itself off. So you're getting these crazy insulin spikes, and that's just not healthy. Uh, these are ways that you can reduce your general uh, carbohydrate intake, which is a good idea. The less carbohydrates you take in, mostly the better uh, to a certain point. But generally, it's recommended that you get no more than 32 grams of um, added sugar in a day. And I invite you to go and look at the serving size on your Dr. Pepper or whatever it is and look at how much sugar is in there. If you want to feel real bad, go look at any kind of fruit juice. Okay, uh, They are terrible for you. Absolutely terrible in terms of sugar intake. Well, there we go. Proteins, uh, breaking down into about 20 different amino acids. Uh, we use these for all sorts of cellular procedures as well as the formation of general proteins. Eight of these are considered essential amino acids, and those are which we, we can't get from our diet. Wait, no, wrong. Those are the ones we can't make. We have to get them from our diet. There we go. That's better. Uh, any food source that's considered a complete uh, complete protein, a complete protein source, uh, will have all the amino acids. Uh, you may have heard somebody say you are what you eat. That is a falsity. Uh, in reality, you eat what you are and you're in better shape. So if you consume animal proteins, you're going to get all the amino acids you could possibly need and uh, be, be just fine. You can also get all of the uh, needed amino acids that your body requires, all the essentials, from some non-animal sources, but they're almost all soy based. They're almost always soy products, uh, which if you're not aware, presents all sorts of problems. Uh, the, the estrogen issues for both males and females that revolve around the intake of too much soy are a real issue, a real problem. I had a student one time and uh, we, were, we were chatting and she said, I don't know what's wrong. Something's up. I'm having like two periods a month. It's totally crazy. This is wild. I don't know what to do. And we had a little bit of a conversation, and it came out that she drinks a pile of soy milk. And I said, you should maybe consider cutting that out for a few months. And she did, and her um, her menstrual cycle stabilized. It was because of all the crazy amounts of hormone in that soy product. So you got to be really freaking careful with that stuff, folks. And again, for both males and females, it is a potential problem. Uh, and then, of course, if you are a vegetarian, there are incomplete protein... Um, materials out there. So nuts and grains, you know, fruits and veg. You can get most of the, the protein you need, most of the amino acids you need. You just got to mix it up a bunch to make sure you get them all or else you end up with problems. Uh, and it's worthy of mention here, the, uh, eating too much protein can lead to kidney stones, that is a fact. And there is some link potentially between eating too much red meat and cardiovascular disease, but I have a hard time buying into that kind of thing. I think most of our cardiovascular issues are due to sugar, not protein. Uh, let's see, is this the last but not least? Almost. So lipids, um, lipids are fats, oils, and cholesterols. Uh, we must have these. They are a requirement. There are saturated fats and unsaturated fats. Saturated fats uh, tend to be of animal origin, whereas unsaturated fats are, are liquids at room temperature and tend to be of plant origin. So oils are plant-based lipids, whereas um, butters and things, lard, those are animal-based lipids. Now, worthy of conversation here is LDL and HDL. If you go to the doctor and they pull a uh, blood sample, they're going to look at your LDL and your HDL. LDL is low-density lipoproteins. Uh, these are considered bad cholesterol. Basically, they uh, keep cholesterol available in your bloodstream, which increases your risk of cardiovascular disease. Whereas HDL, which is considered good cholesterol, pulls the uh, cholesterol out of your bloodstream, decreasing your risk of heart disease. 
You can also help this along the way by taking omega-3 fatty acids. These are thought of as being heart healthy and assists you with um, uh, maintaining a healthy cardiovascular system. You find these mostly in fish-based products. And then, of course, there are trans fats, which are terrible for you. These are made in a laboratory and will take you straight to heart disease. So avoid anything that says partially hydrogenated or contains trans fats. Uh, these are ways you can reduce general cholesterol in your system. And then, last but not least, are vitamins and minerals and antioxidants. Okay, so minerals are minerals. They're very simple. Iron and magnesium and zinc, these are minerals. Our bodies have to have these. It's important. Uh, but they are, are pretty prevalent in the foods that we take in. Vitamins are a little different. Vitamins are not at all what you'd expect. Vitamins are huge organic molecules. They're really big and significant. Like, you know, vitamin C is in OJ, for instance. Well, that's the chemical formula for vitamin C. Here's folate that we've talked about for, um, uh, like, prenatal vitamins. Here is retinol that's used in your eyes to help you see. I think that's cis retinol? Anyway, uh, regardless. So these are big, complex molecules, and, yeah. Yeah, they're coenzymes. That's fine. They're very important for, for us. They're very important for us. And then last but not least are antioxidants. Uh, you can go on, like you can pause this video right now and look up Palm Wonderful commercials. Palm Wonderful pomegranate. And they're going to be like, ooh, packed with antioxidants. Super good for you. Well, let's talk about it. So antioxidants are chemicals that are thought of as decreasing the rate of oxidation or transfer of electrons. Uh, so our metabolism sometimes mobilizes electrons that theoretically could move through our tissues and cause problems. Antioxidants are thought of as taking up these free radicals. Okay, They take them up and uh, prevent them from moving around the body, theoretically causing damage. The problem with this is that there's been a lot of studies done on antioxidants, um, like pill form antioxidants, and they show no effect from them whatsoever. No effect. Uh, we think that potentially the reason people tend to be healthier if they're eating a lot of fruits. Wow, that was thunder. Holy cow. Let me finish this up. We think that the reason people are healthier if they're getting a lot of ant antioxidants is because they're typically eating a lot of lightning. There's lightning? Yeah. And the shoes are outside. I'll go get them. Y'all stay in the house with your mama. <laughs> I know. Stay in the house. <laughs> uh, anyway. So, <laughs> so um, what am I talking about? Oh, so the thought is that if you're consuming a lot of uh, veg no, 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 fruits, strawberries, blueberries, what have you, a lot of fruits will have a lot of um, antioxidants in them, that you're probably going to be healthier because you're eating a lot of fruit. That's going to have a lot of fiber. You know, it's good for you. It's a good for you thing. So it may not be the antioxidants necessarily. It may be uh, the effect of just a better diet overall. All right, that's perfect. Now, if you want to be a cool kid, my advice is to go and buy this book. Okay? If you want to know some things you can do to get yourself back on task and to live a longer, healthier, happier life, you need to go and buy Why We Get Fat and What to Do About It by Gary Taubes. Holy cow blow your mind. If, if any of the dietary conversation we've had this semester has been surprising to you, you're like, wow, that sounds crazy. You should go and read this book. Read this book, and it will change the way you view diet in our nation. All right. All right, that's it. So let's stop there, and, uh, you know, have a good day. Thanks, guys.